Church, how are y'all doing this morning? Good, it's good to worship with you all. It was so good hearing your voices and singing together. And I just want to say anybody who's joining us online or maybe you found us during the pandemic and you've been connecting with us online, uh, we are missing your voice and we'd love to sing with you and experience you and meet you in person and have you come and join us. We'd, whenever you're ready, we'd love to, to see you. Um, my name is Ryan. If we haven't met yet, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here, pastor of Family Ministries, and we're in a series right now. Our church does uh, sermons in series connected to one another ideas and Our series right now is called Family Tree, where we're taking a look at different topics, different issues that the family faces. And we all belong to a family in one way or another, whether we are single, whether we're married, whether we're a grandparent, we all are connected in some ways to our family. And one issue, one uh, topic that is facing families and facing all of us in one way or another is this issue of technology that you saw in the video uh, kind of unpacking in that. And I wonder how many of us uh, relate to the experience of that guy in, in that video, that our lives are saturated uh, with technology. Uh, our world has seen a, such a rapid increase in the development of technology that's left many of us wondering how we ought to incorporate it into our lives in a, in a healthy way. And what does that even look like? Like, as I was preparing for this, I thought of how saturated my everyday is with technology. I wake up, the alarm goes off, my smartphone is next to my bed. Uh, contrary to every piece of advice that I read in preparing uh, for this message. There it is, okay? And so uh, I get up and uh, I'm going to try and work out in the morning. I've been walking in the mornings to try and keep the, you know, winter weight off. And so I throw in my, uh, my headphones and I go downstairs and I listen to a podcast or I watch some sort of show on my phone while I'm on the treadmill, come back upstairs and I sit down with my Bible, usually a physical Bible, but not always, but I always have my phone nearby because I've got Bible software on my, on my phone. I have access to the biblical languages and hundreds of commentaries and all sorts of things. So, and sure, sometimes, you know, notifications go off and there's a distraction and I see the news feed, right? But I'm reading the Bible and then usually sometime between uh, that and the time I leave for work, I do some sort of Spanish lesson on my phone, trying to keep up on the Spanish with Duolingo. That's the app I use and head out the door, listen to some sort of podcast in the car, get to work, spend all day on my computer. I'm emailing, I'm messaging, even in the meetings that I'm in, we're all on our computers taking notes. Sometimes, Jack, to be honest, we're, not, we're doing other things and taking notes. We're, you know, checking Facebook, whatever it is during those meetings. You've never been there, I'm sure, okay? I spend all day on my phone messaging people. I go pick up my daughter from school, get home, and it's time to connect with the family. But to be honest with you, I've got my phone. I feel the push notifications come through. It's really tempting to pull it out and to check again and again dinner, kids get to bed, and then it's time to, it's, it's us time, it's me and Jenny, and man, it's so easy to sit across from one another in the living room and grab our phones and scroll and scroll and just show each other the tops of our heads. And sometimes we use technology to connect, but other times we use technology to be separate and to entertain ourselves. I don't know, does that sound anything like your lives? <laughs> maybe a little bit, or maybe I have a problem, but technology saturates, it does, technology saturates our everyday lives life and we try and grapple with this as what does it look like to to use technology wisely and I'll be honest with you I, I don't want you to come away with Ryan's wisdom or advice I want to ask what does the Bible say about this what does God want from us and so I've kind of titled this message tech savvy to be tech savvy and I don't mean that in having some sort of expert understanding of technology but savvy in the sense of being wise how do we use technology uh, wisely in our lives what's the proper place for technology in our lives. Because what I've found is that if we don't think biblically or critically about this subject, we'll have one of two default reactions. We will either uncritically reject the newest, the latest technology because it's new and it's frustrating and I don't understand it and it's not the way I've always done it, or we will uncritically embrace whatever the latest technology is and say, what could go wrong? Look at all the things that I can do with this. This is great. And we'll be uncritical about the latest forms of technology or using it and incorporating it into our lives. So I do not in this time want to tell you how to use technology. I don't want to give you a a bunch of rules or a bunch of uh, wisdoms for me. I want to help you learn to think biblically, think Christianly about technology. How would God have us think and then hopefully equip you to ask some questions about the role that technology plays in your family, in your home, 
in your life. So first I wanna give us a biblical theology of technology. I know that sounds fancy, ooh, okay. I wanna walk through from Genesis to Revelation, kinda unpacking what is the Bible, how does the Bible depict humans and their use of technology? And then I wanna give us two different lenses through which to view the technology. Whatever technology you're using in front of you, through two different lenses through which that we can view our technology and ask, are we using it wisely? So let's start in the beginning. If you have a Bible or if you wanna turn on your Bibles, or turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter one. We're gonna start at the beginning. Uh, Genesis one, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, is uh, the, the beginning, the creation of God with human beings. He creates the world good and he puts humans uh, in the garden of Eden and gives them a job to do right away. And so we see that in Genesis chapter one, it says that humans are created in God's image. And then in verse 28 of the first chapter of the Bible, we see this. We see that God blessed the humans, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So this is before humans are sinful and selfish, okay, and God gives them a job. It's to fill the earth and subdue it. Have lots of babies, fill the earth, right, but also fill the earth with the things that humans create and to subdue the nature, the order of creation, actually bring it under God's reign and rule. That's a part of our job as humans. Then in the next chapter, chapter two, verse 15, if you scroll down or if you skim down a little bit, uh, we see uh, zooming in on day six of creation, we see God putting the human, God putting the man, right, in the garden, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. If you grew up thinking that work is a product of the fall, <laughs> that it's a, uh, the work is a bad thing, sorry to tell you, work was a part of the design of God for human beings. He gives us a job to do. We were to take care of the world, to bring it uh, under God's reign and rule, to develop and to fill the earth. God packs creation with potential, and he intends, I believe, humans to discover and to develop that potential. So many Bible students throughout history have kind of done this thought experiment. What if the fall had never happened? What if humans had never rebelled against God in chapter three of Genesis, many have thought that had they passed the test, humans still would have gone on to develop technology, to invent things, albeit not sinfully, right? But to fill the earth and to subdue it. But then what happens in Genesis three? Humans take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they rebel against God, they disobey God, and then death and chaos and sin is unleashed into the world. And so throughout the rest of the Bible storyline, we see an intertwining of two themes, right? We see human beings developing technology and that's a good thing because they're filling the earth and subduing it. They're using their God-given abilities to do that. But we also see humans misusing technology, misusing the technology that they create. Let me give you just a quick survey. In Genesis 4, we see, uh, and these are like verses that no one ever looks at or talks about, but if you go look this up, we see humans develop the ability to create tents and farming uh, and musical instruments and metallurgy or forging, like they learn how to make tools, okay? And we go, that's a good thing, that's great, because now humans can, uh, can farm, they can produce crops, and they're gonna have to, because now the world is a hostile place to live. But with that same technology that they learned to develop tools, what else did they learn to develop? Weapons, yeah, they make swords, and make knives, and axes, and they learn how to chop each other into bits, and kill each other. With the same technology that they learn to make musical instruments to praise the creator God, they also use those instruments to worship idols, and to make songs and worship practices that do not honor God. We go on further in the story, we get to Genesis 11, we see humans develop this brick-making technology that says they can build these bricks, and so we're like, oh, that's kinda cool, humans are building, they're building a city there, and, and you go, that's great, and then they build this tower, and not to bring honor and glory to God, not to fill the earth like God wants them to, but to build a name for themselves to stay clustered together and to build this empire. And so God deals with them. It's a technology they develop and 
there's actually an interesting hyperlink, the only other place in the Hebrew Bible where that word for bricks, those bricks there in Genesis 11, the only other place it shows up is in Exodus chapter one, where Pharaoh is using that technology uh, as he enslaves the Hebrew people, as he enslaves the Israelites. So we're supposed to connect those dots and go, oh man, the same technology that is a good thing for humans, they build, can be made into this uh, prideful arrogance in the Tower of Babel, or slavery and injustice in the Exodus. We keep going on into the book of Exodus where God's people are redeemed, rescued from slavery. They get out into the desert and God, it says in Exodus 35, he fills these couple of folks with the knowledge and the skill and the ability to make the tabernacle. It's this, it's this tent. It's a mobile Eden. It's designed like a garden, but they're crafting it and they're designing it. And it says God's filling them and empowering them to do that. It's pretty cool. It's this technology. And and yet we see later on in the book of Isaiah that that same kind of person, a craftsman, also uses their skill to make idols, to make carved images, to make golden engraved images that they bow down to. We see this intertwining of these two themes. Technology is good, but humans misuse it. And we get to the story of Jesus. Jesus is God's son, God, the second person of the Trinity. He is fully God, fully man. Jesus is a, it tells us in Mark 6, Jesus is a tectone. Do you recognize that tech? He's a carpenter, he's a builder, that's what he does. And yet, Jesus is killed on a human invention, isn't he? On a cross, probably built by a carpenter. The same technology that maybe could be used for good to build things is used to crucify the Son of God. And then we get to the final pages of the Bible in Revelation, we see a picture of Babylon in chapter 17 through 18, this embodiment of all evil empires that uh, use technology to subdue people and to create a godless society and enslave people and promote injustice. And yet we see it contrasted with another city in the last pages of the Bible in, in Revelation 21 and 22. Go there with me to the last pages in your Bible to Revelation 21. Remember, human beings started in a garden, in the Garden of Eden, and at the end, as John sees a picture of the new creation, he sees this, Revelation 21, verses 22 and following. Read with me. John says, I did not see a temple in the city, that's the new Jerusalem, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. That's fascinating. Verse 25, on no day will its gates ever be shut and there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. And they'll see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there'll be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. That's what humans were designed to do in the beginning, to reign, to rule. And in the final picture, they will, we will reign and rule in a new creation. But notice, we started in a garden, naked and unashamed. The final picture of a new creation is not back to the garden being naked. It is a garden city. It is God's beautiful creation integrated with human design and technology. And there's that mystery, there's that puzzle in there that the kings of the nations will bring their glory, will bring their splendor into the new creation. It's like, what's that gonna look like? That's fascinating. I, I, wanna, I wanna imagine, I wanna dream just a little bit and say, man, what will that look like to have the, the things that human beings have created brought into and purified and brought into the new creation? So we see these themes intertwined throughout the Bible that technology is good. It's a good gift that God has given and it develops and yet humans abuse technology. They misuse it. We misuse it. All technology can enhance our embodied 
image bearing as God's images, or it can detract from it. Technology can be a blessing or a curse. And we know this in our own experience. But let's get practical because uh, we're not discussing, we're not wrestling with whether we should drive a horse and buggy to church or whether or not we should drive cars. We're not wrestling with whether or not we should use, uh, you know, crude farming implements or, you know, tractors or whether or not your kids should listen to eight tracks and, and albums and CDs or, or not. No. We're, we're in a whole nother uh, set of, of questions, right, about digital technology, about the ubiquitous presence of Wi-Fi everywhere and a constant access to information at our fingertips at all times, that all of us have supercomputers in our pockets, or most of us do. And so how, do we, how, do, how does the Bible help us view this realm of digital technology? How does it help us make sense of how, what the proper place of technology is in in our lives. So I want to give us these two lenses through which to view technology. Whatever technology you have in front of you, whether it's a video gaming system or your smartphone or VR or um, an app on your phone, social media, I want you to view those things through these two biblical lenses connected to the theology of the Bible that we just looked at. So lens number one is this, that technology can be a gift we enjoy and use wisely. Technology can be a gift that we enjoy and we use wisely. Uh, theologians have this category we call common grace. It's the idea that God's special grace is salvation, forgiveness of sins, but God gives common grace, gifts to all humans. Just by virtue of being a human, you benefit from these gifts of God. And we would say that technology is one of those gifts that we can thank God for. It. And it's a part of our calling as humans to develop technology, to invent. We might have some inventors of future technology in this room right here. And technological innovation brings huge benefits. All of us are benefiting from that right now. If you're watching online, you couldn't have done that 50 years ago. You are benefiting from the development of technology. So it's a good thing. The question is, how do we know when technology is functioning in its proper place in our lives? What are the signs? And I would say, as I've kind of processed this, that when technology assists in our role as image bearers, that's a good thing. So if it assists in our work, in our worship, our proper worship of God, and our rest, actual rest, grounded in God. If it assists in work and worship and rest, that, that's a proper place for technology. That's a good thing. If it assists in forming us into the image of God, into the image of Christ, who is the image of God, then it is, it's in its proper place. That could be learning more about God, it could be uh, cultivating virtue or character in our lives, or it could be enabling us or helping us resist sin. Those are all God-honoring, glorifying, proper, wise uses of technology. That's a sign that it's functioning the way it should. So if your default reaction against technology is to kind of do this, like new technology comes around and you roll your eyes, you're like, oh, the world is going to hell because of technology. <laughs> you're despairing of technology. Let me just encourage you to ask a couple questions, all right? So as you look at a piece of technology in front of you, ask this question, is there something here that I can thank God for? Is there something here in this technology that we can thank God for? Give him the credit. Because by the way, if we don't give God the credit, then humans will take credit, right? We'll become like Babel, making a name for ourselves. Look at us, look at the things we've invented, look how amazing human beings are. No, 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 we give, we give God the glory, right? So is there something that we can take, or that we can give God glory for, thank God for? I think about uh, the ability, like I said earlier, to, um, to have Bible language tools on our phones. I, I jokingly tell people that you have access for free to things that I paid thousands of dollars for in seminary. <laughs> like the internet has given you access. I'm not bitter about it at all, uh, okay? <laughs> But you can get all that stuff for free, you know what I mean? And that's amazing, that is God's gift. Translations of the Bible at our fingertips, amazing. Uh, we, can, uh, we can listen to sermons from around the world, that's God's gift, we can thank God for that. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, amen? Amen. 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 Another question to ask if your default is to resist technology or to be critical of it, is what way could this technology help me develop 
as a human, as an image bearer? How could this technology help me develop as an image bearer of God? And uh, here I get this from a book called The TechWise Family by Andy Crouch, a really good resource. Um, and he makes a distinction between technology that uh, helps us cultivate skill and character, distinguishes that from technology that offers us ease and comfort. There's ways of using technology that helps us cultivate skill and character, and then there's technology that offers us ease. An example would be if you have used technology to learn a language, for instance. Uh, if you've used technology to learn an instrument. I was uh, talking to my dad. Uh, we were trying to fix some sort of plumbing issue, and uh, he's like, oh, I'll just come over and, and do it. And I said, Dad, I didn't think you knew anything about plumbing. He goes, Ryan, um, have you, there's this thing called YouTube. You can just... <laughs> You can just look up videos and they'll just show you how to do it. And I'm like, yeah, dad, I know about YouTube. You know what I mean? That's awesome, right? So he's using that to develop skill and, and cultivate a skill as, a, as an image bearer of God. That's a good thing. It's an honoring use of uh, technology. Could this technology be used to help us develop as an image bearer of God, as a human being? That's another question to ask. Another further question, again, if you're resistant to the latest technology, uh, is... Uh, related to this, this thing I see sometimes with parents, that parents will watch the way their kids use technology and be totally uh, despairing of it. They'll walk into a room of teenagers on their phones or uh, engaging in whatever their video game is, and they think, we never had that. You know, we never had those problems. But think back um, to the amount of time that you spent in front of a TV as a kid, <laughs> you know? Like, the TV was always on in our home. The amount of hours I spent in Saturday morning cartoons uh, getting absorbed in that. So the question to ask is, is this a new, unwise use of technology, or is it parallel to a form of technology that I'm used to? Is it just another way of doing what I'm already used to, and I'm, I'm more so resisting the newness of it than I am the actual use of it? Does that make sense? So if you walked into your living room and all your kids are on their devices, you might think, oh, they're wasting their time, their brains are melting. But if, you had, but if they're reading or if they're doing homework on their devices and you had walked in 30 years ago and they had papers out, you wouldn't have felt that despair, right? So it matters how we're using technology. How are, how are we actually using it? And the question is, is it, uh, is it something that's new and unwise or is it just a different way of doing something we used to do another uh, way. So for instance, uh, you may have grown up playing board games with your parents, but now you engage in playing video games with your kids and you connect with your kids uh, doing that. Uh, that's just a different way of connecting. It's using technology to connect with your kids. And we shouldn't just be resistant because it's new and it's different and it's not what I grew up with. So is this similar to what, or a new way of doing what I used to do? And then finally, a question to ask would be, how can this technology be redeemed for the glory of God and the spread of his kingdom. How can this technology be redeemed for the glory of God and the spread of his kingdom? As I was preparing this, I searched and thought about is there any form of technology that is totally unredeemable, you know, that couldn't, God could not use? And I thought, TikTok. Like TikTok, for some of those you don't know, it's a social media app, and every time there's a new social media app, I just roll my eyes and think, ah, oh, do I have to have another, you know, username and password? And, uh, and I thought, TikTok for sure, it has to be like just this godless space, you know? Um, <laughs> but as I explored a little bit of TikTok and had to avoid falling down the rabbit hole of all sorts of viral videos, uh, but I found a couple, a couple um, awesome God-honoring people who are doing apologetics videos that have hundreds of thousands of views people who are engaging with arguments for the faith and ideas of Christianity, and God is using TikTok, even TikTok, you know, to expand his kingdom, right? If God can redeem you and I, he can redeem TikTok, amen? Yes. He can, he can. Now, is there a lot of trash on TikTok? Yes, yes, there is. Should we be careful? Yes, but can God redeem it? Sure, yeah, he's God, he's God. So can God redeem this and use it for the advancement of his kingdom? Technology can be a gift that we enjoy and use wisely. But the second lens, lest we uncritically adopt all forms of technology, the second lens through which to view technology is that technology can be an idol we worship and misuse. Technology can be an idol we worship and misuse. If you're unfamiliar with that term idol or relatively new to faith, um, I, I had to look this up myself in, in a little book called uh, Pastor Ryan's Book of Helpful Definitions that probably need more clarifying 
but will do the trick for now. And so it was under the eyes. Uh, and so here it is, idol. This is what an idol is, okay? An idol is anything that is more important to you than God or anything you go to for what only God can give you. Anything that's more important to you than God or anything you go to for what only God can give you. Do we do that with technology? Absolutely. We go to technology for uh, satisfaction, for entertainment, for pleasure, for comfort, for security. Anybody have a ring doorbell on their phone, on their, on their door? We, we trust in our technology when we should be trusting in God sometimes. We go to it for all sorts of things that we ought to go to God for. So it can become an idol that we misuse. And so what are the signs that technology is being worshiped or misused? Would be that if technology begins to master us, if it begins to master us, that we begin to serve it, that's a sign that it's being misused or worshiped. If it begins to malform our character to make us less like Jesus, then that is a sign that it's become an idol in our lives. Or if we're using technology to engage in sin or to hide our sin, that is a sign that technology is not in its proper place. It's being worshiped or misused. So if your default is to uncritically embrace technology, then let me ask you some questions. Let me throw out some questions for us to, uh, to process through. The first question to ask is, in what ways is my use of this technology forming me? In what ways is my use of this technology forming me, actually changing me? A guy by the name of Tony Ranke wrote a book in 2017 called 12 Ways Your Phone Is Changing You. And he goes through detailed kind of social science analysis of the ways that smartphones are actually changing our, our neurological systems, our, the ways that we interact with each other. So I'm just going to list a few. He says that as a result of having smartphones, we are addicted. We become addicted to distraction, we just are always, we never want to be bored. We can constantly distract ourselves. He says we ignore flesh and blood. We ignore the people in front of us because what's on our phone is more interesting than what is in front of us. We ignore God's creation because what's on our phone is more interesting. We crave immediate approval, likes and shares and followers. We crave immediate approval. We get lonely. Technology, instead of bringing us together, can divide us can isolate us. Huge correlation between use of social media for teenagers and loneliness and depression and anxiety. We fear missing out. We see what other people are doing and if we feel like, ah, oh, our life is so much worse. We're discontent. And we become harsher with one another when we don't interact in person. In what ways is your phone, your, your technology, in what ways is your use of it forming you, changing you? Second question to ask is this. Am I using this technology as a tool to do something, as an excuse to do nothing, or am I being used by this technology by someone else? Am I being used by someone else? Am I using it as a tool, an excuse to do nothing, or am I being used as a tool by someone else? Many of us have gotten lost on a Netflix binge or a YouTube binge. The next video just comes up, just got to wait five more seconds, and it, and it plays, and we can waste our lives doing that or scrolling. And the truth of the matter is, that is not an accident. There are uh, designs, there are algorithms designed to keep you addicted to your phone, addicted to your screen. Why? It's all about the money. If you are not paying for something, then you are being paid for. Someone is paying to have you engaging with that technology, that app, that product, to watch that video. You are being manipulated. We are being used by other people. That's a part of the reality. We need to be aware of that. Doesn't mean we become Amish. We totally withdraw. We need to be aware. Are we being used? In what ways are we being used? Or in what ways are we using technology as an excuse to do nothing? Are we getting uncomfortable yet? Okay. A couple more questions. 
what are the unintended consequences of using this technology as often as I do or in the way that I do. And I don't mean, I don't mean simply um, that it's a bad way to use the technology, but I, what are the unintended consequences? For instance, uh, so many of us have gotten used to streaming church online. Some of you are doing that right now. We're glad to have you with us. And that's an awesome benefit. It kept us safe during the pandemic, enabled us to stay connected when we're out of town. That's a, that's a gift from God, amen? It is, it is. But what might be the unintended consequence of you simply engaging church by watching it as content to be consumed? You could begin to think that the church is a product to be consumed as opposed to a family to belong to. That would be an unintended consequence of a good gift, of a good gift, right? But what are the unintended consequences of doing things on our devices instead of in person? Those are questions we need to wrestle with. Another question is, are there any sacred times or spaces in your day that are technology free? Any sacred times or spaces in your day, in your home, that are technology free? Are there any restrictions or rules on when you can and can't use technology? And if you're single or if you're uh, an adult and not a a student or a kid, uh, we have a harder time because there's no one putting those rules on us. You have to uh, come up with those rhythms. So Andy Crouch, the author of uh, this book, The TechWise Family, he suggests, and I find this a helpful starting point, he suggests, what if for one hour a day, for one day a week, and then he says, for one week a year, we had kind of technology-free, digital technology-free uh, time. Consider this, for one hour a night, turn off your phones. Maybe it's the hour before your kids go to bed. Just say, I don't need to check my phone during this time. I'm just gonna be present with my family. Just one hour, and you can have it back after an hour. But consider switching off our phones for one hour and see if it releases the grip that our technology might have on our hearts. Some families have found it helpful to create a media covenant to say, this is how our family uses technology, all of us together. I wanna recommend a book, it's called Right Click. Uh, It's about uh, parenting teenagers in a digital world. Right Click, it's blue, it's very nice, small. Uh, And they go into, in detail, creating media covenants for your family to create helpful rhythms for your family. And then finally, the question to ask is, are there non-digital ways of doing whatever I'm doing right now on my phone or on my device? Are there non-digital ways of engaging in this? Uh, like the creators of Jurassic Park or the, in, the scientists in that movie, they spend all their time uh, trying to figure out whether they could do something that they never stop to ask whether they should do it. So often that's how we treat technology. I can read on my phone. I can listen to audiobooks. I can uh, get the news pushed into my phone 24 hours a day. We need to stop and ask, should we? Or should we be connecting with each other digitally? Or would it be better to get together in person? Those are questions we need to ask. Is there a non-digital way of doing this that we could engage in? Just some questions for reflection. Technology can be an idol that we worship and misuse. It's meant to be a tool, not a master to serve. So I want you to ask yourself, I'm asking myself, how is your relationship with technology? Are you happy with your relationship to technology in your home and in your life? How is that going? That's a good question to process over lunch today or with your family. And if you're beginning to just get stressed out or exhausted by this, if you're like, oh, this is so much work, you begin to despair at the rapid increase of technology, let me give you a word of hope as we, as we wrap up. God is not surprised by our technology. Amen? There will never be an invention that humans create that God goes, oh, no, they figured it out. Oh no, I, didn't, I was hoping they wouldn't get to the wheel for another couple thousand years, right? God wasn't looking down and saying, oh no, they figured out electricity, ah! Now they can stay up all night instead of sleeping and resting. God didn't go, oh no, Facebook, ah, no! No, 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 God sees the future, God knows the future, and God is sovereign, amen? And so no matter what comes down the pipe, as humans create self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, all of those things. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to despair. God knows the future. God is sovereign. 
and he will provide us with the wisdom that we need. He'll provide us with the hope, the uh, motivation that we need to pursue him. And he provides us with the forgiveness that we need when we sin by using technology and when we stray from him all through Jesus. And so let's commit to, as a church body, helping one another use technology wisely keeping it in its proper place. And when we fail and when we sin, going to Jesus for forgiveness and saying, Lord, I'm, I'm so sorry. Thank you for dying in my place. And we go to the cross. So let's do that. Let's commit ourselves in prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? And we'll pray and then we'll respond in worship. Father, I confess that I too often have made technology an idol in my life. I confess that I've used it to distract myself from my family and my kids instead of caring about the needs of my wife to be distracted with other things. I have gone to technology for what I should go to you for. And so I confess and thank you so much for your son Jesus for dying in my place. Father, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit? Give us the wisdom that we need to use the good gifts that you've given us without falling into the trap of idolatry. I pray for those in this room who are enslaved, Lord, to sin, enslaved to addiction, enslaved to their devices. God, that you break chains, that you free us to worship you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We love you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.